Well, happy Father's Day. And I hope your day is filled with as many dad jokes as you can think of. Um, and uh, and we're, we're going to be talking to the dads today, especially as we look in the Word, word, word of God. A, um, a mother and her four-year-old son were looking through an old fa uh, family photo album and the boy pointed a, at a picture of a handsome young man that was in there with dark curly hair and, and he, he was really genuinely confused and he said, he said, Mama, who's that? And she said, well, that's your father. And the boy looked really confused and said, well, who's that bald guy that lives with us? <laughs> so, you know, dads, it's just rough. Some, some kids, uh, you know, talk to their mother. They, they, these kids talk to their mom about getting a hamster and, and, and she finally agreed she said, listen, we can get a hamster as long as you take care of, this, of the creature. And so, guess what happened two months later, moms? Anybody have an idea? She was taking care of the, of, of the, the hamster, which the, the kids had named Danny. And so she was caring for Danny, the hamster, and, and uh, finally she just had had enough. And so she made some phone calls and uh, found a new home for, for Danny. And she broke the news to the kids and and they took it, took it really well, actually. But they did offer a few comments. And one of the, one of the children remarked and said, well, he's been around here a long time. We'll, we'll sure miss him. And, and mom agreed. And she said, yes, we will miss him. But he's just too much work for one person. And, and since I'm that one person, I say he goes. Another child offered and said, well, maybe, maybe if he wouldn't eat so much. And maybe if he wouldn't be so messy, we could keep him. But nevertheless, no matter what the argument, mom was firm. And she said, no, kids, it's time to take Danny to his new home. Go get his cage. And with one voice and a tearful outrage, the children said, it said Danny, we thought you said Daddy. <laughs> well, today is Father's Day, and, and it's tough being a dad in today's world, isn't it? It's, it's easy to feel un unappreciated or, uh, or, or, or at least underappreciated, and, and many people in our culture, don't really understand the importance of a dad in the life of his children. It's sort of like the little girl who, who once said to her mother, she said, Mommy, if Santa Claus brings our presents and God gives us our daily bread and Uncle Sam gives us Social Security, why do we keep Daddy around? It's easy for us to take our, uh, our dads for granted. But do you, do, you, do you know why? Do you want to know why we keep Daddy around? You want to know how valuable a dad is? Listen to these statistics. Children from a fatherless home are five times more likely to commit suicide. They're 32 more times more likely to run away. They're 20 times more likely to have behavioral disorders. They're 14 times more likely to commit rape. They are nine times more likely to drop out of school. They are 10 times more likely to abuse alcohol or drugs. They're nine times more likely to end up in a state-operated institution. And they are 20 times more likely to, to end up in prison. Sounds like a dad is pretty important. You know, a, a good father is one of the most unsung unpraised, unnoticed, and unappreciated heroes in all of humanity. And I've got to tell you, godly fathers are even scarcer, and, and they should be exceedingly treasured. You know, we could go to many places in the Bible for an example of a godly father, and one example is that of Joshua. Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 through 18, records a defining moment in the life of Joshua and in the, in the nation of Israel. It says this in verse 14 of, of Joshua 24, so fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors? We're getting a little, little bit loud there. Uh, would you prefer the, the gods of your ancestors serve beyond, uh, beyond the Euphrates, or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. The people replied, we, we would never abandon the Lord and serve other gods. For the Lord our God is the one who rescued us and our ancestors from slavery in the land of Egypt. He performed mighty miracles before our very eyes. As we traveled through the wilderness among our enemies, he preserved us. Preserved us. It was the Lord who drew, drove out the Amorites and the other nations living here in the land. So we too will serve the Lord, for he alone is our God. You know, at the age of 110, 
Joshua summoned the, the leaders of Israel to Shechem for a farewell address and he, he charged them to obey the Lord who had fought for them and, and had given them an, uh, that land for an inheritance. And, and the truth is he chose a perfect setting because Shechem was the place where God first told Abraham that he would give the land of Canaan to his descendants and that was where Abraham then built an altar to, to God. And now in this setting, nearly 700 years later, Joshua calls the elders of Israel together uh, following the the fulfillment of God's promise. And Shechem was a a place of sacred memories. As Joshua spoke, he did so with with the authority of experience because he had walked for with Moses for 40 years and and now he had at this point he had led Israel through the conquest of Canaan for another 25 years and Joshua challenged the people of Israel to never forget that God was the one who, who had given the land to them and he told them in that moment he said choose today whom you will serve and then he reinforced his appeal with the, the power of a good example when he said but as for me and my family we will serve the Lord Joshua was the priest of his home. And that's what God wants each of us men to be. But, but we hear that, and we don't live in a society the way the same type of culture that Israel did in the, during that time. And we hear that, and we, we need to ask ourselves, what does that mean? Uh, how do I become the priest of my home? How can I become the spiritual leader of my household? And I, I want to share with you just three things that you can do to help you grow in this area of becoming priest of your home. And, and, and first of all is this, uh, to become the priest of your home, you, you must acknowledge that a father is responsible for the spiritual life of his family. You know, Joshua acknowledged his responsibility when he said, but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. I want you to notice what he's doing there. He's actually, he's speaking for his family. He's declaring his family's intent. He's saying, listen, I'm leading my family in the things of God, and I don't know what your family is going to do. I don't know what you're going to choose, but he's saying, listen, for me and my family, this is our choice. We're going, to, we're going to serve the Lord. And he accepted, in that moment, he accepted the re- leadership role that God had given to him. See, God has given to each father the responsibility to, the, to be the priest of his home. Now, here's a thing, some things I know about a priest. One is that a priest cannot function unless he is in close contact with God. The priests in in Israel, they had to go into the presence of God. They had to go into the temple. They could not carry out their functions and stay at home or or stay away from God and be out of his presence. A a father leads by example. And, 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 you know, you've heard me say this before. It's kind of a joke. But, you know, children lead, uh, excuse me, children learn in three ways. You remember these, don't you? They learn by example. And then they learn by example. And then they learn by example. Because it doesn't matter what you say. You can say all the right things, but they're going to follow what you do. And and so you're always teaching. By every decision you make, Dad, you're always teaching something to your kids. You're teaching them something when you you decide to stay home from church. You're teaching them something else when you say, I'm going to be in the house of the Lord. Your your example is, is leading your family but, but here's the key that all of us dads need to understand. You cannot lead your family where you have never been. You can't lead your family into, into a, a, a walk with Christ that you don't have. You, you can't live a life of spiritual indifference and then expect your children to serve God wholeheartedly. You, you can't live... Here's a real big one because dads get really upset when their children get rebellious toward them. And, and, and very often, by the way, rebellion is a response to hypocrisy in the home, but that's a whole different message. But I'm here to tell you, you cannot live your life in rebellion to God's commands and then expect your children to submit to your authority or God's authority. Dad, I beg you, make sure your relationship with God is healthy because your relationship with God is absolutely vital to the health of your family. It's a father's duty to make sure that his children know what it means to, to be saved and how, what it means to follow Jesus and how to walk in the ways of the Lord. And I can tell you this, the greatest thing a father can pass on to his children is his love for God. You know, uh, uh, chil- Christian fathers, they feel a lot of pressure to be a spiritual influence on their children. 
We, we worry about all the pressures that face children today that are, that are countering the values that we want to impart, and, and we worry what's going to happen, and, and we, we don't know how to bless our children. We don't know how to, uh, to give them the tools to keep walking in the ways of the Lord. Well, I want to give you three, three practical ways, Dad, that you can bless your children. Number one, we, we can bless our children with our words. With our words. You know, how many of you ever heard the phrase, actions speak louder than words? That's true. We've actually already addressed that. That your example is very, very important. They're going to follow your example. But I'm not talking about your example. I'm talking about how you can be a blessing. How you can bless your children as the priest of your home. And to say that actions speak louder than words does not mean that words are not important. I can tell you this. Children, they long to hear the words from their dad. To hear their dad say, I'm proud of you. They long to hear their dad say out loud, I love you. You know, we men, sometimes we just, we just uh, really have a hard time expressing what we're feeling inside. Part of that is because we're, we are so emotionally illiterate that sometimes we know we're feeling something, but we just don't even know what it is. So, uh, so listen, ladies, if you have a husband and you always say, what are you feeling right now? When they say, I don't know, they're not just putting you off. They really just can't figure out. They're saying, I feel something, and it's a mix of stuff, but I can't quite put my finger on it. But your kids need to hear those words from you. Second thing is we, we bless our children through meaningful touch. By giving a hug or, or a touch or an arm around the shoulder. Or, you know, if you're like in my family, a noogie once in a while. You know, just something uh, to communicate love and a blessing to them. I, I read about something that, writ, that was written by Robert Russell. He wrote this, he said, when my sons were little, we used to join hands and have prayer at the end of the day, and then I'd give them a, a kiss good night. He said, when my son Phil was about nine years of age, he got in bed one night and said, Mom, I can't remember whether Dad kissed me good night or not. So Judy, his wife, told me, I tiptoed up the steps and I bolted through his door like I was a monster and dove in on his bed and wrestled with him and tickled him. And we laughed and I kissed him and, and then we just laid there in the darkness for about 15 minutes and talked one of those rare special times with your, with your child. Well, the next night he got in bed and said, Mom, I can't remember whether Dad kissed me goodnight or not. That was the signal right there, wasn't it? So again, I bounded through his door and jumped in his bed and wrestled and tickled and laughed. And every night for weeks after that, he'd, he, as soon as we'd say amen, he'd run away from me and get in bed and say, Dad, you didn't kiss me goodnight. And I'd have to come and jump on his bed and wrestle and carry on. It was a great ritual. He said, I knew it would have to come to an end someday. Can't have a 34-year-old with a wife and two kids and me knocking on the door saying, I'm here to give you your goodnight kiss. One night I was in his room, we were wrestling and carrying on, and I finally said goodnight and walked out and walked by his older brother's room, and I said, goodnight, Russ. He said, goodnight, Dad. I got to thinking every night Russ hears me, hears us laughing and carrying on in the next room, and I just go by and just say goodnight. Maybe he'd want me to do that to him. So I bolted into his room and jumped in on his bed and, and started wrestling with him, nearly got whipped if I remember. It settled down and I, decided, and I decided it was time for me to express how I felt. And I have to be honest, I have a hard time saying to a person individually sometimes what I want to say. He writes, I said, Rusty, I want you to know how proud I am of you and how special I think you are. And I want you to know I love you. And he said, okay, Dad, just that. No big thing, but I felt better because I had expressed it. The next morning as I was walking by his door, Russ said, Dad, would you come in here a minute? And he writes, I went in. He hemmed and hawed a bit and pawed the floor. And finally said, Dad, thank you for coming in last night. I never get too old for that. Your touch means something, Dad. Third thing, we bless our children by letting them know they are valuable to us. Now, this goes beyond words. We already talked about words, but it goes beyond words because now uh, we're, we're expressing value in the things that we do. You know, it means that we sacrifice time for them. It means that we, we look them in the eye when we're talking to them to express to them that they are important to us. We, it means we stop and, and listen to them even, even if it's not convenient for us. 
How many of you have, uh, dads in here have discovered that either your wife or your kids will want to have a, a conversation about something right in, in, the, in the worst possible moment, probably right in the middle of a game? You know what I'm talking about? I think it's planned, but I have no evidence of that. But uh, Josh McDowell, great uh, Christian apologist, great, uh, very prolific author, he tells a story uh, about his relationship with his son. Josh was working on a book. He, he's written many, many books, but he was working on a book, and he had a deadline to meet, and he was, he was sort of running behind a little bit. And as he was in his study, he was feverishly working, and his, his little three-year-old son came in and, and wanted to talk to him. And Josh was caught up in the moment of trying to get this work done, and he looked at his son, and he said, he said very nicely, he said, Daddy's very busy right now, son. We'll spend some time together later. And he left the room a little dejected, a little sad. Well, moments later, Josh's wife appeared in the doorway. And she stood there with her hands on her hips and with that look in her eyes that all men know and fear. You know what I'm talking about. And she looked Josh straight in the eye and she said, Josh, you're always going to have a deadline. You're always going to have another speaking engagement to prepare for. You're always going to have all these things that require your time. But she looked him in the eye and she said, but you're not always going to have a three-year-old son who wants to spend time with his daddy. And with that, she turned and left the room. And Josh sat there. And, you know, it's easy for us as men, you know, to get real defensive. But he was open and, and he just felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit just wash over him like a wave. And he, he says he, he fell on his knees right there in his study and he repented before God. And, and then he called his son back in and he took some time to be with him. Now, that story, keep that in mind, but fast forward 50, about 15 years or so. Now, 15 years later, his son is now the starting point guard at a Christian, uh, for a Christian college's basketball team. And Whenever he could, he's very busy and he travels all over the place speaking. But whenever he could, Josh would arrange his speaking schedule to try to make it to one of his son's games. And in one particular instance, Josh was able to rearrange his schedule at the last moment. And he, and he flew in to watch his son play. And, and as I said, his schedule was changed at the last minute. So his son didn't know that, he, that his dad was going to be at the ball game. Well, Josh arrived at the gym while the... Varsity women were playing their game and his son was sitting in the bleachers with the rest of his team, uh, with the rest of the men's varsity team, watching the women's team play. And his son didn't see him come in the, the, to the gym right away. And, and, and Josh began to make his way toward the bleachers where his son was. It didn't take very long for his son to, son to notice that he was there and he just came bounding out of the bleachers to go greet his dad and and the student body began, began to watch Josh and his son as they grew nearer and nearer to each other. I felt bad. You know, he said he felt bad for the uh, women's team because uh, nobody was watching the game anymore. They were watching this father and son as they were growing closer and closer to each other. And, and finally, they met right in front of the scorer's table, right there at half court. And his son threw his arms around his dad's neck and he hugged him and he kissed him. And the students who, as I said, are now watching Josh and his son more than they're watching the women's basketball team and in that moment when that happened all of a sudden they just erupt in applause well that caught Josh off guard and later that night while sitting on the plane flying to his next destination he began to think about that and he and trying to figure out why they were why they would break into applause in that moment he came to a couple of conclusions but one of them that's applicable for us today he realized this. He said if he hadn't met his son when he was three, year olds in, three years old in his study, his son would not have met him at half court when he was 18. Men, fathers, show your children the love of Jesus through a life filled with love. Take time. Communicate their value. There is nothing more important than your, than, than your relationship with Jesus, your relationship with your wife, and your, the relationship with your children. Everything else can wait. Everything else can wait. Second step to becoming a priest of your home is to realize that a father shapes his children's view of God. 
Now, the family will, will usually follow the parent, especially the father. I, I read about a, a man who worked at a feed processing plant, and he, he, every night when he went home, the boys would, would look at it, their dad, and he'd come home, and he was just really, really dusty from the plant. And they would say, boy, Dad, you sure are dusty. And the man just would kind of grumble within himself, but then he would just smile at them and, and say, yes, I sure am dusty. Well, one Saturday morning, he started washing his car, and as he did, his oldest son, who was four years old at the time, uh, was outside with him, and the, the, his son began to pick up small stones in the driveway and began rubbing them all over his pants. And his dad looked at him and said, he said, son, what in the world are you doing? And he said, I want to be dusty like you, dad. And in that moment, that man suddenly realized that if a son would look up to his father for being dusty, he would look up to his dad for anything. I want you to know, and you already know this, but I want to reemphasize that your children are watching you. They're paying, paying attention to the way you live your life, and their futures are being shaped by your example. And now, now there are many dads here today that are leading their family well and their, their children are learning from dad's example that, that serving God is the most important thing in the world. And I want you to know, dads, if that's you, then you are leaving a godly heritage for your children. And I know this for a fact, your children your, will cherish a godly heritage far more than any earthly thing you could leave for them. I know that because my dad, when he passed away just over two years ago, he did not leave a lot of money for us. There's not a big inheritance for us at all. But I look back and I value beyond money, beyond anything he could have left, I value the heritage, the godly man that he was. He showed me what it meant to be a godly dad. And I value that more than anything he could have left. But dads, the relationships you form with your children, this is a very heavy thing to think about. The relationships you form with your children will play a major role in determining what they think God is like. You, you say, what am I talking about? Well, you know, you, you go to church, you read the Bible, and it talks about a father in heaven, right? Right? We talk about him. We pray to the, our Father in heaven. Jesus said we should pray that way. And, and when they hear the word Father, what is their point of reference for that word? You. You're their point of reference. You know, there, there are some people in this world that they hear about our Heavenly Father and they struggle with believing that God loves them because they struggled all their lives with believing that their dad loved them. See, you have an impact because, because you are the only point of reference that they have as to what a father means. And by the way, dads, if you're doing a great job with this in your family, there are other kids, there are other children that, that you can have an impact on that maybe they, they don't have a dad in the home or maybe their father is not serving the Lord, but you can have an impact to show them what it means to be a godly father. I, I remember when my dad passed away, I wasn't planning on talking about any of this, but I remember when he passed away and we were sitting there and many friends from my teenage years that, uh, that uh, I hadn't seen some of them in, in decades. And they would, they would call and say, can I stop by? Can I come by and see the family? And we'd say, sure. And they'd come by and they'd sit. And I can't tell you how many, but I mean, there was, there was a man, and they're not, we're not so young anymore, but sorry to say young man after young man, but maybe not young, but in my eyes, we're still young because my brain is still 18, but my body doesn't agree. Yeah, most of the dads here can understand that. But, but those, those guys, those, those young men from my childhood, from my teenage years, they would stop by. And I'm telling you that person after person after person after person looked at me and through tears in their eyes, they began to say, I learned what it meant to be a dad by watching your dad with you kids. I learned what it meant because I didn't have that in my home. I didn't have a dad or I had an abusive dad. Or, or as they said, I learned what it meant to be a, a good husband by watching the way your dad treated, treated your, your mom because we didn't see that in the home that I'm growing up. I want you to know, not just on your own kids, but men, you can have an impact on people that you'll never even know. My dad had no idea. He had no idea the impact that he had on their lives. But I tell you this, you're firm in 
yet, yet, yet tender hands will, will help your children learn about our Heavenly Father's love for them. The atmosphere of love and care that you develop will draw them to God instead of, instead of drive them away from Him. When you're that kind of man, read a touching story about a humble, consecrated pastor whose young son had become very ill and after the boy had undergone an exhaustive series of tests, the father was told the shocking news that his son had a terminal, terminal illness and there was nothing that the doctors could do. Now the youngster loved Jesus and so the, the, the father, this, you know, this pastor was not worried uh, about, you know, he knew that he would go to heaven should he pass away, but, but, he was, but when he heard it, he wondered how in the world how do you inform someone who's in the, the bloom of youth that, that they're soon going to pass away? Well, after earnestly seeking the direction of the Holy Spirit, he went with a heavy heart through the hospital ward to the boy's bedside. And first he read a passage of Scripture and then he prayed with his, with his son. Then he gently told him that the doctors could promise him only a few more days to live. And then he looked at his son and he said, Son... Are you afraid to meet Jesus? His little boy, blinking away a few tears, looked at him bravely and said, No, not if he's like you, Dad. Not if he's like you, Dad. That's the impact you can have, Dad. You show them who Jesus is with your love, with your compassion. Thank you, Dads, for the powerful spiritual impact you're having on your children. Third step to becoming an effective priest in their home, in your home. And this, this is so important. It's to remember that a godly father is a man of prayer. There's no substitute for prayer. And, and, and I, I, you know, when I say that, I know what happens is because, because we get these pictures in our mind of famous men of God, you know, who uh, you know, the hist history tells us that some of them got up at three in the morning and prayed three hours every morning before they started their day. And I'm not saying that, that you have to do that. I'm not saying that that's what you have to develop. I, I think it'd be wonderful if that happened in your life. But I'm saying that, that you make prayer a, a, a part of your, the culture of your home. The, and we need to understand that there is no substitute for prayer. There's nothing else you can do. Prayer is a weapon in the hands of a father that can move the hand of God on behalf of his family. Nothing else we do invites the presence of the Holy Spirit into our homes and gives him permission to work in our family. That's what we're doing when we pray. And nothing you do, dads, listen to me, nothing you do will have as great an impact on your children as your prayers for them and with them. That's going to have the greatest impact of all. So you need to pray. You need to pray for them and with them. But you also, you need to pray for yourself. Any, any dads here, uh, you would, by raise of hand, I want you to tell me, you've got this dad thing all figured out and you know exactly how to do everything. From, from Anybody here, you got it all figured out? I don't see any hands. And if you did raise your hand, I'd call you a liar. Um, either that or you're delusional, which is a possibility. You might really believe that you have it figured out. But, but listen, you, we got to pray for ourselves. We need to ask God and say, God, help me to become the right kind of father. Because we all want the right kind of kids, right? We want kids that, are, that, that, are, that, are, that grow up to love the Lord and, and walk in the ways of God. But, but here's what we got to realize is that when I become the right kind of father, then my children will probably become the right kind of children. Because that's the impact I have on their lives. Seek God's wisdom for your family. You don't know, you don't have all the answers, Dad. And it's okay that you don't. You don't have to know how to fix everything. But seek God's wisdom and say, God, give me wisdom on how to lead my family well. And then pray for God's strength to live a godly example for your family. Because the truth is you can't do it on your own. You can't just muscle up and, and be a godly man. You've got to let the Holy Spirit empower you to become a godly man. And then ask God to continually fill your heart with love and compassion for your wife and for your children. But you also not only need to pray for yourself, you need to pray for your family. Pray for your kids. Ask God every day, God, protect my kids. 
God, protect my kids from the evil one. I'm telling you right now that the enemy is out to destroy your kids. He's out to destroy your family. And he's not even doing it covertly anymore. Now that you can see it on the news where organizations are, are, are calling for, for the, the dis, disbanding of the family unit. And, 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 and the reality is it's the worst thing that could happen. But, but the, the enemy wants to deceive your kids. He wants to destroy your kids. He wants to fill their minds with lies. And you need to pray and ask God to protect your children from the, the works of the evil one. And then pray that God will help you build a strong fear, spiritual foundation for your children's lives so that when they grow up and they begin making their own decisions, they will grow up to know Jesus. They will grow up to love Jesus. And they will grow up to serve Jesus. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. If my kids become successful financially, I'll be happy because they can take care of mom and dad. But if they don't, as long as they know, love, and serve Jesus, then I have been a godly and a good dad. And I've done my job. Third thing is this, ask God to use your children in the kingdom of God. Say, God, raise up my kids. Use them in the kingdom and, and use them in, in greater ways than I could ever imagine. God, I put them in your hands. If you want to take them as missionaries into a dangerous land, my heart is fearful of that, God, but I trust you with them. If you want to use them in, in the business world, then God, you do that. But God, you use my kids for the kingdom of God to do greater things than I ever dreamed of doing. Number four, release your children to God through your prayers. Place them in God's hands. Trust Him with them. Release them. You know, there's a, there's a passage. Uh, I can't remember now if it's Psalms or Proverbs. You know, you get older and everything just kind of runs together in my mind. But it says that... Children are like arrows in the quiver of an archer. You know, here's the thing I've learned about, I don't know a lot about archery. I've, I've shot, you know, bow and arrow a few times in my life. I understand how uh, the basics of it, and here's one of the basics. One of the basi basics is that it doesn't matter how far back I pull that, bow, that bowstring, it doesn't matter how well I aim the, the, the arrow. It doesn't do any good if I don't let it go. The arrow will never hit the mark until I release the arrow. So as a, as a dad, listen, you, have, you play a big part in, in being used by the Holy Spirit to, to draw back that bow and to aim your children's lives at the target that he has set for their lives and saying, I've got a calling for them. This is where I want them to go. But there comes a moment in time when you, dad, and, and I'll include the moms here too for this one, but you have to let them go and say, okay, God, now they're yours. Now they're in your hands. You guide their path. Your, their path. You take them to hit the, the bullseye you take them wherever you want to take them and then number five pray for God's guidance and provision for their future here's what I know you have all, all the kids that are here now maybe if you're old enough that you have children of your own you understand this better but to the kids that are here listening I want you to know you have absolutely no idea how much your father loves you, even if he has difficulty expressing it to you. I can tell you in the same way that a mom, there's a mom's heart that is just so deep and wide that, it, that I want you to know a father's heart is just as deep and just as wide and longs and loves for you, his children, loves his children just as much and just as deeply. And there is an ache inside for our kids. And I want you to know any children in the listening here, I want you to know you don't, you don't, you can't even begin to conceive how much your dad loves you. Patrick Morley in his, man, in his book, Man in the Mirror, told a story about an ill-fated fishing, fishing trip. We'll close with this. A group of fishermen had landed in a secluded bay in Alaska. And they had, they had a great day fishing for salmon, but, but when they returned to their seaplane, uh, the plane had landed in this bay in this particular area in the wilderness. But when they got back to the seaplane, they were, 
Sur surprised to discover that it, it had run aground because of the fluctuating tides and and they had no option except to wait until the next morning when the tide came back in. And so the next morning when they, when they got in the plane and they, they, they took off, they, they only got a few feet off the surface of the water when the plane came crashing back down into the sea. Because being uh, uh, beached the day before, something had happened and they had, they had punctured one of the pontoons that the seaplane was sitting upon. And, and it filled up with water and now it was, it was too heavy and off balance to take off. And, then, and, and it, it crashed into the water and it slowly began to sink. And there were three men and, and a 12-year-old boy on that trip. The boy was one of the men's sons. So they prayed and they jumped into the icy cold waters to swim to shore. The water was cold. The, 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 the current was strong, but, but two of the men reached the shore safely, but they were exhausted. And they looked back and their companion, who was also a very strong swimmer, did not swim to shore because his 12-year-old son was not strong enough to make it. They saw that father with his arms around his son being swept out to sea. He chose to die with his son rather than live without him. There is a fact of life that most kids do not fully comprehend. And that, as dad, and that is that as dads, we love our children so much, we would die for them without hesitation. Without hesitation, if I were to ask every father in this room to stand who, who would do the same thing for his son or his daughter, I dare say that every father in this place would leap to his feet. But the truth is, beyond that, I want you to hear this. The truth is that most dads lay down their lives every single day in order to care for their families. And Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Here's what I'm here to say today. Dads, we would be lost without you. You are so valuable to this nation. You are so valuable to this church. You are so valuable to your family. And we're here today just to say thank you to all the dads in this place for the impact you have on, on the lives of, of your children. You, you, thank you for laying your life down for the good of your family. Thank you for laying your life down every day, going to work and doing sometimes things that you don't want to do, but be, you do it because you know that you are called by God to, to take care of your family. Thank you for laying down your life for the spiritual health of your family. Thank you for laying down your life so that your family can know and love Jesus. And though there are times, I'm sure it's true for all dads, there, there are times when you feel taken for granted. I want you to remember the powerful impact you're having on your family. And I want you to know we are grateful for you. We're grateful for you. Now I want to say this, if you're a dad and you're struggling in any of these areas, we're, we're not here today to beat you up about it. We're here to encourage you that your family life can be better than ever before. The truth is, we all have room to grow. Nobody's perfect, right? Some of the moms were a little too quick to, you know, to uh, respond to that, but, uh, but we all have room to grow. But, it, but I also want to say, if God has helped you grow strong in these areas, then, Dad, I, you need to go to God and say thank you to Him for His help because He helped you get there. I want, to, I want to close by reading a simple prayer that I found. Then we'll say a prayer for our dads. But here's what it says. It's, I, I love this. It says this. Mender of toys, leader of boys, changer of fuses, kisser of bruises. Bless him, O Lord. Mover of couches, soother of ouches, pounder of nails, teller of tales. Reward him, O Lord. Hanger of screens, counselor of teens, fixer of bikes, chastiser of tykes, help him, O Lord. Raker of leaves, cleaner of eaves, dryer of dishes, fulfiller of wishes, bless him, O Lord. To all the dads who are all of these things and more, we say thank you. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for letting God use you. Thank you for letting the love of Christ show through your life. Thank you for touching not only your kids' lives, but the lives of other children. Thank you, Dad. Every dad in this place, 
Thank you, Dad. Would you stand together? Actually, stay seated. Here's what I want. I want the dads just to stand. The dads that are here today, I want you to stand. I want to pray for you. For you, you well, I, I should say I want to pray for us dads. Because I need prayer as much as anybody else. I'm a dad with nothing but girls in the house. I need lots of prayer. But, you know, you're all sitting here and you're looking and you see these men, these great men, great men who love Jesus. And, I, you know, all of our hearts should be filled with gratitude. Don't you think so? So I want you just, before we pray, I want you just to take a moment and I want you to put your hands together just to say thank you to all the dads of this church and the dads that lay their lives down every single day to care for their families. Would you do that? Just, just give them thanks. And now, Father, we pray for, for these dads and for dads that may be watching online. God, you know the, the heavy weight, you know the responsibility, and Lord God, we don't shirk from that. We, we accept that. We, 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 we take that wholeheartedly, God, knowing that we don't have the strength or the wisdom to do it on our own, but God, we take it on because anything you call us to, we know that you're going to equip, equip us for. And so, God, I pray for these dads. Some may be feeling uh, unappreciated. Some, Lord God, may feel like they, that nobody sees and nobody cares. But, God, I just pray that today they would know that's not true, that there'd be children and spouses that express to these, to these men, Lord God, I'm grateful for who you are. I'm grateful for you, for, for you being a great dad. I'm grateful for you being a godly dad. Thank you for leading our home into, into the presence of Jesus. And God, I pray that you would bless these men and that you would help us all to grow, Lord God. None of us are perfect. We all have so much room to grow. And I just pray, God, that you would raise us up as men of God to be able to lead our families well, Lord God, that we would have an impact even beyond our families. And God, I pray, I pray for, for homes, Lord God, that maybe because they're broken or for other reasons that where there's no dad, Lord, I, I even pray especially, I pray for those moms, those single moms that are trying to carry out both roles. God, I pray that you would just raise up godly men in the lives of, of their children that will have an influence and an impact on their lives. God, I thank you for all that you've done and all you're going to do. And I pray, Lord, you would bless this, this wonderful Father's Day and that today, God, that you would be honored most of all because you are the only perfect Father that we have. And we give you thanks and give you praise, Lord, for all that you've done and all you're going to do. And we ask it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.